Sweet. What up? Are we live? I see a red button there. Isn't that button supposed to be green? It's supposed to be red. Check. Red means business. All right. So who's going to be the first one to tell us? You guys have an echo or you're actually on time. Um, I think that might be a first. No, we're on time a lot. You're just over I think we're, I think that this. I think we earned our own award. I think that we give ourselves something for being on time. Hey guys, what's going on? Don't know if anyone has even tuned in yet, but tonight we're going to talk about a pretty intense subject. So uh, at least it is right now in the Midwest. Um, and we're hoping to get some information from you guys. We're going to pass on some information I think that you guys are going to find helpful um, and hurtful uh, in some cases because a lot of what we're going to talk about is we don't really can't really do anything about it. No, nope, part of nature. Yep. So, um, but anyhow, so tonight's topic is going to be EHD. And I guess I'm going to start off by asking, does everyone know what EHD is? Um, and we'll look for people's comments and see, but someone explained to me what exactly EHD stands for. Um, and I'll explain. So the reason that this topic has come up with is because um, we live in South Central Iowa and right now we have a, I don't know if the DNR would consider it a major epidemic, but there's an epidemic in, in Warren County, it's a major epidemic and some of the surrounding counties. But the, the concern, the problem that we have is that not only um, is it in Warren County, but it's starting to spread and we're early in that the only thing that's going to stop this is probably not going to happen for a while. So yeah. we don't know how far it's going to go. I hope that we're not back here doing this again um, and telling you, boy, it's gotten way worse. I hope we just kind of forget about it. We'll see. Um, did anyone answer yet that they know what EHD stands for? No, I'm mostly just talking. I think let's I think let's first start about what EHD is and then go into maybe the difference in EHD and blue tongue and then talk about how it's uh, how it's passed, how it, it goes Absolutely. from deer to deer, and, and what it does to the deer. Well, um, so if you want to start with that. Don't rub on the mics. Where's the mics at? Where are they? Oh, okay. All right, Where I'll try and uh, He's got avoid down. it. Oh, there's one over there. Joe says they now have, um, they have confirmed cases in Indiana, and then Dustin Gaskill says, uh, E something hemorrhage disease. I can't spell the rest. <laughs> All right, we'll help you out, Dustin. It's episodic. Oh, Todd Lewis just got it. Yeah. Epi episodic. I'm not sure if it's episodic or episodic. No, episodic. But it's one of the two. Episodic hemorrhage hemorrhaging disease, um, basically meaning that the animal is going to um, build, start to internally bleed from and by the internal hemorrhage. Hemorrhaging. Yep. That's what bleeding is. The internal bleeding gets so intense that the animal begins to develop a fever, hence the reason that they end up at water. Um, I can tell you, I was told that at one time that they go to water because blue tongue is, the, the description that I was given was that blue tongue, which we now have found comes more, that is more. Um, there's really very, not a difference in the, that. The, the, the biologist explained to me there's not much of a difference. However, there is one and they use the blue tongue term more with livestock. Yep. And, and, but in both cases, the animal develops a fever. It was a myth, at least my myth that I was told was that their tongue would swell and that's where the blue tongue term came from. And then that would cause them to try to get a drink and they couldn't. I think on the cattle they did maybe. It, it could or, be, but, but episodic hemorrhaging disease is different than blue tongue, but not enough. If you, someone's referring to a deer died from blue tongue, they're talking about EHD. Um, so that's what you need to know. Some of the things that you can look for um, to know what's going on is um, deer that otherwise would be normally healthy. I mean, is the way the biologists put it, meaning you find a deer laying, just laying on the ground and it doesn't look, there's no bullet hole in it. It's not got broken legs and doesn't look like it's been hit by a car. doesn't look like coyotes have drug it down. Um, that animal probably died of EHD. Now, the time of year that, you, that EHD becomes more and more prevalent seems to be uh, late summer to early fall. Sometimes it starts as early as mid, early summer or mid summer. We found one this year that um, it wasn't confirmed by a biologist or anything, but we believe 
it was at definitely EHD because it's right where all that's been happening, and uh, that was July fifteenth. So, and and I think that was probably an early case because I hadn't seen any other reports or any um, nobody else had said anything that they'd seen any or found any. Uh, so that's why I, we didn't even really think that it was EHD to begin with, is because it seemed like a random case that deer was out in some CRP. It wasn't near a water source. Um, just randomly drove up on it and it was dead. We actually posted that one back then. And then we find out, then everybody, uh, probably at a, about a week later, started posting that they had found dead deer near water sources. And then that's when we realized and confirmed that it was EHD. That's the deer that you found, isn't it? That's the first no, one. No, that's the second one. That was the second one, yeah, okay. The, one, the first one we found is actually a little was bigger than that, probably 130 some inch deer. Right, we're gonna talk a little bit about, um, we have some theories, we wanna hear some of your guys' theories. Um, we'll get to that in just a minute, but here's what we were talking about is, you look at this deer and it and otherwise looks completely healthy. It doesn't look like there's anything wrong with it. And so, how, where does the HD come from? I don't know that the, the, the biologists have figured out, nor are they, from what I understand, are they really looking into where does where did it originate from and how can they get rid of it the reason that they're not looking at that is because it only affects the deer it doesn't affect human beings that at least as of right now where cwd and some other things they believe could affect humans so therefore there's been more research done on that um, we think it's a shame to see these deer die like this but again it's mother nature's way um, you know but so the here's the question i have for a bunch of you guys do you see more bucks than does die from EHD? Because I do, I see more bucks than I do does. I personally have never found a fawn. However, the biologist confirmed fawns are killed by it as well. Um, but I definitely see a higher percentage of bucks. The biologist has explained to us that he believes the reason that more bucks are killed during the summer months is because the bucks are in bachelor groups. Now this part is extremely important to understand because this made a lot of sense to me why EHD gets so spread, spread so and so quickly is, so the midge fly is what carries the EHD virus. And all it takes is one midge fly to have the virus. He bites, he or she bites the deer. When they bite the deer, they infect the deer. The deer now has the EHD virus. Any other midge fly that doesn't have the disease bites that deer, now is a carrier of that disease. When those midge flies bite another deer, then they get it. And so what ends up happening is you have a bachelor group of bucks, five or six bucks together, maybe more. They, one of them is bit by the wrong fly, they get it. Now the other flies bite it and they bite all those other deer, all those bucks are killed. Typically in the summertime, your does aren't in big groups, they're in their you know, doe and fawns type thing, um, maybe a couple does, but not in big groups. So, right. Um, um, Chris Miller says, what do we think about baiting deer on public land? Is it uh, partly at fault? Um, Chris, I would, this would be my answer to that. I would not say that uh, baiting deer or, or concentrating deer in one area is necessarily going to be at fault for spreading EHD. It probably doesn't help because it is bringing them to a concentrated area, but at the same time, it doesn't matter if you have a pile of corn somewhere or not during the summer, your, your bucks are still in bachelor groups. Um, lots of deer are still going to the same food sources, bean fields or whatever that may be um, near you. And I think that, I think those deer, uh, as long as, I think within the same field, that midge is still gonna get to that. Absolutely. And so here's what I would, I mean, <clears throat> and, and I agree with Warren, Chris, there's not a right or wrong answer here. And even the biologist couldn't give us a, it's not like it is transferred only through saliva or only through these deer touching each other. That's not it at all. It's uh, from that midge, that midge fly. fly so it is. if they're in the same cornfield and that midge fly flies over to another deer, they're gonna get it. So they don't have to be touching. So can you make the argument that if you can help your deer be healthier? Possibly, because again, they can't answer that right now. They don't have enough information to give us to be able to say this is what's happening this is what is going to save the deer this is what's going to kill them they just don't know yet right and um, gregory asks have we noticed that nothing will touch them um and other than birds yeah we've noticed the same thing that it doesn't seem like coyotes or anything else really for a gets while heavy on them. but but what i can tell you is the deer that the original deer that warren found 
and and I don't know how long that is that but like this deer hadn't been touched but a few weeks later you go back and that deer is gone so something ate it and I, I don't know if that's, that's buzzards probably, I mean though, it could be most of these most of the time most of our places at coyotes any other deer they're on them within yeah within absolutely. 12 hours almost yeah. all the time so yep. initially the first deer that we found on that farm we found them because of buzzards were right but so, he also that deer had been dead for at least two days I think and other than the birds, I don't think that he'd really been hit by anything else. So I would agree. It, they don't. They aren't like just cleaned up really quickly by the coyotes and stuff like that. If they do eat them, it seems like they wait a while for whatever. But they don't seem to go after them. But the birds don't seem to care. The buzzards are on them right away. Another telltale sign that you got EHD in your area is the smell. Yeah. Without a doubt, the the smell of a dead deer, um, you'll know quickly that they're in that area. I guess the one thing that I would caution anyone that's watching from the Midwest, um, guys, you want to be checking your farms and you want to let the DNR know if you're finding these deer so that they can keep track of what's going on. It's the way they're going to regulate tags and things like that. I would think in Warren County this year, they would probably cut down on some doe tags because um, right now, and I'll be able to give you some numbers here in a few minutes, we got some updated numbers as of yesterday. Um, and the number is pretty devastating in some areas. So. Um, but anyhow, so we were talking about how this midge fly passes it from one to the other and why it, it does, you know, why does it pick the bucks and the does? Why is it, there's another um, little piece of research out there and I have not seen the paper myself. I was, someone spoke to me about it and I want to pass this on because I believe that it could, it, it very much makes sense this outbreak we're having here because the last major outbreak in Iowa so I think let's just go through all of our theories then now okay so everything now that we're about to discuss with you guys is our personal theories okay this is things that we've seen or that we've talked to people there none of this that we can factually prove um, but they've everything I is come from at least trusted sources or we've seen it happen a couple times to divulge our theory I guess yep. so everything you're gonna hear now we have a couple theories on things on what the how the EHD affects the deer why it affects them and uh, what are some of the main reasons and the animals that it primarily targets meaning bucks does fawns so uh, now go ahead if you'd like to so so in 2012 the last major epidemic took place here in Iowa and a, a, a Another um, co-worker, I guess you'd say, passed on to us that um, someone had done some research and found that the midge fly was very similar to like a cicada in that it becomes, it, it had, runs a seven year cycle. And so every seventh year, the number population is at its highest. That's when you're going to see the most probability of an outbreak. And if you look at the numbers in Iowa right now, I just talked to a friend of ours last night as a DNR officer. They are 15 to 20 percent higher than they've ever been. Not. But he's talking about deer numbers. Deer numbers, yes. I'm talking Just about midge fly numbers time. because th this this is this came from some research, and I'll try to find the paper so that I can speak more on it. But for right now, I'm going to give you what um, this person summarized for me, and that was: every seven years, the midge fly hatch is larger than it normally is, and but. And so that next year, we would have almost none. It almost, like they wipe themselves out. And then each year after that, they start to build back up until they get to that seventh year, and then boom, here it comes again. Now, so what you would be looking at is every seven years, you would have a major outbreak. Well, what can deter that is the right weather pattern, right, and meaning lots of moisture either the whole time. And so that helps that none of the deer are congregating around there, and the midge needs mud. Um, they don't need a creek. Running water is bad for them. They like stagnant water that has receded and they live in that mud. So if they never have a chance to actually hatch out of that, then you could stave that off some. So the problem though, that, and then the other one, and then, again, this is our theory. This is my theory anyhow. Last year, we had the perfect conditions in our area as far as to, that we expected to have an EHD outbreak. We didn't get it. Um, one of the things could be that we didn't have the midge fly numbers yet. But the other one also could be that if it gets so dry, there is no mud. I mean, and we were much drier at this time I, last year. I would year. be very interested to see, though, if maybe this makes me think more that every time we hear about EHD, everybody's always talking about the conditions of it. 
that it's the weather that makes those midges do so well and then and then leads to EHD. If you look at our weather and pattern for the last three years, it has not been that much different than no. what we've had this year. It's been very, very similar. And so I wonder if there's more, if that gives a little more um, leverage to the seven year theory yeah. that there's just more gnats or they do better or whatever it is on a seven year period. Because if you look at the weather patterns we've had in Iowa the last three years, they're really almost identical to what we've had this year with lots of lots of rain in summer. Very similar. May have even been a little more dry last year though. Yeah, this year we had we got moisture earlier. Right. You know, um, at least in our area, in some areas got lots of water. Yep. Um, but Warren County, I happen to know that they were getting about the same thing that we were, so they were not getting near as much rain. <clears throat> so anyhow, the other theory that goes along with this then is as you saw up there a minute ago on that picture, the bucks that we have been finding this year were untypically from what I have seen in other EHD breakouts is for whatever reason, and I don't know if it's your mature bucks hang out together, I don't know whether they're more worn down from the rut still from last year and they don't have, but it does seem like EHD will attack those older bucks. Um, what we're seeing this year is at least where we're seeing the deer it's not, it's more of two and three year old type bucks that are, we're finding dead. Now, that brings me to a theory that I wanted to know was, um, and I asked the biologist and they just said they can't prove it, they don't, so, so again, it's a theory. That is, the deer that were born in 2012, 13 in Iowa during the EHD, could they have built up an immunity or could they have been born with an immunity to it because it was so prevalent at that time? And he said that is a possibility that that could happen because they have seen that in the southern states, he mentioned a few such as Georgia, Mississippi, Louisiana, um, states like that, they have found that EHD can actually, those deer can develop an immunity to it because they're faced with it every single year. Now, the problem that he says that we have, and because I said, well, then Warren County should be the place where they should be immune to it because he said that seems to be a place where all these outbreaks start is always, Warren's County is always included in that and always seems to be leading it. So that would make me think that there's some kind of conditions there for the gnat, for the right. mid something fly. in the water or right. um, something that allows them to be more prevalent well. than yeah. other places. So, um, but anyhow, so that could be a theory that some of these deer that you see, some of your bigger deer now are going to maybe make it through this one, hopefully, um, because they have an immunity to it. Right. Um, but what that's going to mean, guys, without a doubt, is that your next two or three years are going to be tough. You're um, going to have the big age gap. Yep. You're going to have older deer and young deer. You won't have that middle aged deer, and that's going to hurt. Yep. Um, so, but right now, as far as we know, no one has developed, and I know there was, there was one company that came out with a, I'm going back to, I can't remember who it was, I think it was a Chris that asked a question about feeding. There was a company that claimed they had a, medicine for the deer that's been proven that th there wasn't enough to be able to say that they truly have that so i'm hoping that someday we do get something um, whether it's something to treat the for the flies where you could spray around stuff like you know and keep the midges from you know hatching in an area near you or is it something that you could feed the deer that would help them build up an immunity to it um, one of those two things would certainly help when it comes to ehd one of the best things that we could probably do though is just shoot does, yeah, shoot no. more does. Because if you look at the numbers, like I was talking about earlier, the numbers of deer is at an all time high. So the same time that this happened in 2012, that there was a major outbreak, the deer numbers were at an all time high then of, uh, just gonna use the gentleman's numbers that gave me this last night. He had to do checks for deers and, or for deer, deers, for deer. He was getting around, he was at a high of 550 animals per check, okay? Last year, it was up to 600 something, and then this year, it was over 750 something. He's never seen it that high, and it was, um, it's out of control, really. And so, and then when we talked to a biologist the other day, the amount of deer, of does that you need to kill to just maintain your population of resident deer. So this means deer that are living on your place pretty much all the time 
I believe it was 20% of the does. He said that 20% and you just break even. 20% just to keep the herd at what it, at what it is. You need to kill at least 30 to 40% to actually reduce the population. I believe he said it was 50% to actually make a dent. Well, when you, when, so when we got to 40%, what he felt, that was a number that they said that the deer could sustain it and that you weren't gonna damage the herd. If you got up to 50%, depending on the numbers, I mean, but 50%, then they saw that the deer couldn't re recover, from, so the number That's would start to decline. Right, so, so I think there's two things there. You could, one, we could say that the seven year theory of the, um, of the bug that it just is more prevalent each seven years for whatever reason like a cicada uh, Could be part of it I think another part of it could just be the numbers and then mother nature is saying okay the numbers are out of control it is time to reduce them and uh, And so mother nature isn't like us. They don't pick out the ones it, it just takes out deer so I think that that could be an important thing to keep in mind is when each time that we've hit an all-time high of deer numbers We've had a major EHD outbreak Yep. Do you, so, you want to tell them what the numbers were so yep. far? I'll go over them in just a second, but here's another picture of another deer we found um, in one of the fields. And again, um, not only do you want to be reporting deer, I think, um, so this is some, several things I learned from the biologist the other day. Number one, when you have not heard of an EHD breakout, make sure that you're notifying them and letting them know, and they got to get to those deer in, within less than 24 hours in order to uh, confirm that it's EHD. So even a live deer that you see that's acting strange, standing in water or something like that, get a hold of the DNR, let them know so that they can come out and, and sample that deer. But that's some of the other things we should talk about what to look for other than dead deer is, and, and I've seen hor horrific videos this year from people that have watched deer walk out into a, a, a water deal and just drown themselves. And what they're doing is they're, they've got a fever and the fever is so high be, that they're trying to get that fever to go away and they don't know how, how else to do it. So they go to water. Which is why you find them by the water right. sources. But we also had a gentleman ask if we always, if you, if they always die next to water. And I would tell you, um, no. no, because we found that several this year that were not what I would consider right next to a water source. So I don't know if they just died that much quicker that they didn't have time to get that fever and go to the water source or uh, whatever well, reason and, it was. Well, and the thing but, is, you may not know, there may be a water source right there that's a puddle that right. he went there trying to cool it, but you know, or maybe they were going there and didn't make it. Um, so no, it's not that, um, so call them, call, call the DNR and let them know and, and then they can figure it out from there if they start to get multiple calls, which this year they've had multiple calls. Now, I did ask this other question. There are years when Iowa DNR has talked about less than, and I got some numbers here on my phone. In a normal year, because I said, is EHD around all the time? Because here's another, and this is not a theory. The one reason why all of us that are watching this tonight and that we're talking about this is because we, we hear about it and we know about EHD. I can tell you guys that I'm 51 years old. And I remember EHD in Virginia, and they referred to it as blue tongue when I was a teenager. That's 35 years ago. But Warren wouldn't have heard about it in Iowa. I, no one in Kentucky would have heard about it, or especially not in North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana. We didn't know people, and we didn't have pa So now we're passing that infora information around. So we're hearing I about, heard about it. it as a kid, though, when it went through the Milk River. Absolutely. In Montana. But but as our information gets much easier yeah. to pass on, yeah. we're hearing about it more. So I don't think that it's necessarily more prevalent than it was. We're just hearing about it more. Yep. With social media, how how often before social media did you know people in Missouri, Ohio, Michigan? Montana, North Dakota, all those places that have an isolated outbreak, where now it's so easy to be connected with everybody and, and a picture gets shared and then we all know, hey, Iowa, Southern Iowa is getting hit with EHD right. or wherever else. So the biologist um, from, the D, from the Iowa DNR informed me yesterday that um, on a normal year, he has seen less than 10 cases, meaning he doesn't even get 10 phone calls that someone found a dead deer that they can't explain. Okay, and I think he kind of throws out, that's not talking about being hit by a car, you know, next to the road. Right. But someone calls, he says, in a normal year with no EHD breakout, he less than 10 calls. The number that he confirmed yester as of yesterday um, was the state of Iowa right now is looking at somewhere, he said, let's call it 440 to 450 deer confirmed dead. 
Um, that's how many have been called in. And I can tell you that means that I don't know whether that's five times that number or 10 times that number or what that is, but there's a whole lot more of them out there dead than what have been called in. Yeah, Guaranteed. I'd say 440, it's at least double probably. I mean, so you're at least a thousand. Okay. And almost, and 90% of that is in one county though. 325 of the 450 are in Warren County alone, Southern Warren County, even below, uh, below in, uh, Highway 92 um, is where most of those have come from. Uh, he had one, he, he gave me the information so quickly, but it had 16, but Clark had 45. So Clark County, which is just south of Warren County, has 45 cases. That seems to be holding in the northeast corner prim primarily. Right now, it's affecting 11 different counties. And I didn't write them all down because um, Madison County is included in there. Um, but all those surround, Lucas is another one I recall him mentioning. But I just put on here, 11 counties right oh, now, they have confirmed. Um, he did say the year that they had the um, major outbreak in 2012 um, that it involved way more than 11 counties. It was much more severe. However, I don't think we've seen this run its course yet. No, it's probably not. You know, um, we're, we're just in the beginning stage, or hopefully we're midway in it. So the next question... Hopefully we're done. Yeah, well, the next question I asked, though, was, we are starting to get some rain. Could that help? And unfortunately, guys, he's telling me that it's too late now. The midge flies have it. It can help. He did say it could help. And the reason it can help is because it can scatter the deer some. They're not coming to the same water sources. Um, mainly what it does is it does ruin some of the um, mating area or the, the place where the midge fly is breeding and, and, ra and laying its eggs. So it can damage that so then there's not more flies. Um, so the rain can help, but the only thing that's going to get rid of the bug giving the deer the EHD is the first frost. So all of you guys out there, we all need to hold, hold hands and we need to say a prayer for a crazy cold weather, cold snap to come through tomorrow and freeze Iowa for a few hours. Yeah, it, um, I think maybe having increased rain might help keep more midges from, from getting it and um, just because the conditions might not be as good for them to be laying eggs. I don't know how long a midge lives. I don't either. So that could be partially, maybe if a midge only run, lives for two weeks or uh, a month and then you get that rain and so then there's not that next um, batch of them that doesn't, doesn't have it, maybe you do get out of it, but I don't know how long, I don't know exactly what midge it is or how long they actually live for, so I can't answer that accurately. Uh, we have two questions. Midges have a total lifespan of little over one month. Adult, adults are capable of flight for only a short portion of that time. So they're, so they're capable of living for a month, but only a short portion of that time can they fly. But, so but, you may, so that may be really, really good then. Absolutely, here's, here's the one thing the biologist told me yesterday that when Warren and I had the conversation, he did not mention, and that is cooler weather can help more than the rain. And the reason is because then the midge flies don't fly as not much. Not as active. They're not as active. So right now we're going through a nice cold keep, snap here and holding, keeping the midges at bay. And then hopefully- It keeps the deer away from water as absolutely. much as well. And so if you could see these midges that all have the disease all be the dying ones right now, and then the other ones don't get it because they're not mixing with each other, we could get through this without it being a major, major outbreak. Right, because uh, it seemed to be pretty isolated so far. So and, and for those for you that didn't hear, um, Dakin said that your midges can live for one month, the typical lifespan, but they can only fly for a portion of that. So I don't know how long, does it say how long they can fly just for? Just says a short portion. Just says a short portion. So let's just assume that that's at least two weeks then, because that would be half of its lifespan. Um, as long as those ones die out, they shouldn't be a major threat to the deer unless they're biting them on the ground. I can't imagine that that many are able to walk up onto a deer and bite them. But um, So that could be really good once you get out of that cycle of those current midges um, once it gets out of that continuing to get, to get it. Uh, so we have a couple questions. Let's answer these questions. Um, there was a good one right here. What makes it so much more prevalent in some states versus others? This is from Kyle. I think, so, well one. Number of deer. 
that's going to make it more prevalent than and then uh, areas that seem to and I can let's go back to the Milk River area because Montana had not seen well, that. Why don't you talk about Alabama and stuff too? Okay, because um, it's maybe extremely prevalent there, but now always. the deer are immune, so it's not as prevalent. Right. What was the gentleman's name? Uh, it. Kyle Stelzer. So Kyle, so here's what we would tell you that, there, so it is more prevalent in the south um, because they have so much more water, because they have such high temperatures, the midge flies exist there. The reason that you don't hear of outbreaks there is those deer have actually grown an immunity to it because they're faced with it every single year. And that's key because the, what this gentleman, what this biologist was telling us was that the reason that Iowa and some other Midwest states, those deer have a hard time fighting it is because they may only see it two or three years and then it moves on and then, or maybe if the seven year cycle is correct, it doesn't come back. So you have a whole group of deer that are born that are never seen it, so they have no immunity built to it. Um, and then I think what happens is, I believe that once you get some deer in a particular area and they do build an immunity, then it kind of, takes care of that, I mean, takes care of itself. Those deer are healthier. It also um, seems as though the midge is somewhat picky on the deer that it bites because we've never, or there's somewhat of an immunity because we've never seen a fawn so far. We haven't seen died. one, but he does say that, that fawns get it as well. Oh, really? But they seem to be very resistant. And, and I would say that's similar to, children are pretty good about fighting off things and, and things like that, but children and elderly are usually the most susceptible. Um, but at the same time, would you find as many fawns? Probably not. Right. Be more difficult to find them. John Hamby asks, are the outbreaks more in Southern Iowa than say Central and North Iowa? Uh, right now, um, John, I would tell you that uh, Lucas, Warren County, Lucas, those surrounding counties, Madison, um, those counties around there, um, to give you kind of a place to look on a map, if you'll look at Osceola, um, New Virginia, um, and then go east of there and up to uh, it, uh, Highway 92, so south of Indianola. So yes, is the answer. <laughs> well, what do you, what, I mean, no, he was asking, where is it? Is he's it saying, in, are the outbreaks more in Southern Iowa than say Central and North Iowa? I, don't, I think I don't, he's talking more of the originate and where they are more prevalent. So John, from what I, what I would say that we understood when we spoke with the uh, you found out that everyone has started in Warren County. Not everyone has started there, but they seem to have the highest number all the time. They have the most consistency yes. of, so yes, I would say that Southern Iowa is more prevalent and then I think it seems to stem from there that it gets passed on. Um, it doesn't seem like Northern Iowa gets hit as hard as Southern Iowa. But the biologist told me yesterday that two years ago they had a huge outbreak, but it was very Their numbers pinpointed. also aren't near as high as Right. Ours either, though, I don't think. But that also could have to do with, and, and here's the thing, and I guess let's go back to Montana and the Milk River, and this kind of would speak to why is it in some areas. Montana, as far as I know, but then again, I don't know if I just didn't hear about it, but I lived in Montana for almost 20 years, and it wasn't until I had been there to almost 20 when the huge outbreak took place there. And what ended up happening is, could that be that the weather patterns have changed enough that it finally got warm enough for the midge fly to be able to move up into that northern tier um, and get there because the Milk River has the perfect place for them to grow as far as water running through there, high grass, lots of a place for um, midge flies to live would be that Milk River area. But as far as I know, they hadn't seen it for many, many, many years, more than seven. Right. And that could be that they see it. You can see a frost in Montana at any month. I mean, well, we've your seen temperatures it. at night right. usually are still getting down close to 45, 50 almost. Right. So, so that's why night. I would say, here's what I would say to answer that completely though, is that I think this Midwest is probably going to be your most prevalent because it's not where enough that they're going to see it every year where the North is not where they may ever see it at all because of the winters and the colder weather where in the middle, you're going to see it more. Right. So through the U.S., I would say where the whitetail numbers are high and the which weather. Which that may also be why, like the Milk River, when they do get hit, they get so hard because they, they don't they have no any resistance. immunity or anything yeah. to it. And the density of the deer there is and pretty insane. And the other thing to note that they did confirm that antelope will also get it. Now they, now they did say that the mule deer did not. However, we were guiding at that time. And I can tell you, and you'll see it some, some here, 
you'll see hooves that are like peeled back. Um, and you'll also see antlers sometimes that don't come out of velvet or they seem to be odd, like soft. Um, and oftentimes testicles are messed up and that is a sign that those deer were fighting EHD and they beat it, but it, but it took its toll on their bodies. Right. Jimmy asks, um, are you concerned about eating deer now? No, I'm not. Not at all. Okay. Patrick says, I would say at least five times the numbers going off of the decline of numbers of deer. I was, I was seeing the season of EHD compared to the season before in Branch County, Michigan. So he's saying that theirs was way more than what was reported. And I, uh, I'd no say we absolutely agree with you, Patrick. I, you remember a few years ago, Illinois had an outbreak that um, we know people down there that they went from seeing 30 or 40 deer in a day to not seeing two or three. I mean, it really, 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 and it took them six or seven years to yep. come back. Uh, Seth Baranowski asked, do we have to deal with CWD as well like they do in Wisconsin? Um, there's been reported cases in Iowa. I don't believe there's been any that we know of real close to us. No, not yet. And so, so. we don't, so what he's referring to though is they have certain things they have to do for a CWD county. Like they, I believe that in Wisconsin, and Seth, you could tell me if I'm wrong, um, but I understand that in a CWD county, there is no baiting um, and things like that. We have not seen that here yet. Um, so in Iowa, we're allowed to bait, um, but we cannot hunt over it. We're not, and so I don't, it's not baiting, it's feeding. And we are allowed to feed deer. Um, we pull all ours out before hunting season ever gets here. But the way the law reads in Iowa is that you just can't hunt over it. You have to be, you can't hunt in any way, shape or form that that deer could be going to and from that food. So we just suggest everyone get it out before the hunting season starts. Yep. And don't, have, don't, be, put, don't put yourself in that situation. Okay, next question. And then I'm gonna, I'm gonna Mark, I'm gonna come back to yours because yours is gonna take a little longer to answer. Uh, Jason Mills asked why we're not on the Outdoor Channel because we're now on the Discovery Channel. So Sunday mornings, 8 a.m. I believe, yep. on the Discovery Channel, or if you, aren't, if you can't catch it there, you can always get them on the app, Raised Outdoors app, whenever you want, all of the seasons. Okay, so Mark asks, what can we as hunters do to help? Partner with the DNR, install cold water stations on the property, talk to our neighbors about reporting dead deer, donate money somewhere, or just pray for an early hard frost. <laughs> Uh, I think that's kind of a loaded question. I mean, what's his name? Mark. Mark? Yep. Mark, I can tell you we've considered all of that. Um, and I agree with you, man. You want to do something because it is a horrible death to watch a deer die like this. I mean, it, 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 but I don't know that any of that, all of that would help. Everything that you just mentioned would help. Reporting it to the DNR and, and doing things like cold water stations and things like that. I don't, and I, but but I really don't stop. think that. Yep. I mean, even if you in, were putting water sources there, I don't think that it would be enough to be able to, the deer would have to solely drink out of just your water right. sources. Um, and it's not like they know that the fly is in a place, so right. they're not going to know, don't go over here because it's bad. Yep. So honestly, probably the best thing that you can do is try to make sure that your numbers are in check and that you're shooting as many does as you need to be. That, uh, that would probably be the number one thing because then even if you do get it, hopefully it doesn't circulate as quickly and as intensely um, as it has in the past. So that's all the questions we have so far. Um, so I, I do have a picture or two here that I can show you of what could possibly be deer that have survived an EHD breakout. Um, but that, I don't know that for sure. Um, I got two of them here. And, but the other thing is, so I don't know if you guys can see these two balls and, and uh, someone sent us this one. So um, I can tell you, I'm gonna show you another picture of a deer that someone also sent. And then they sent us a picture of the deer hard horned after that and said, this whole thing actually fell off after the the deer shed its its velvet now i don't know this one doesn't have any antlers beyond that so i don't know if that will or not okay so um but anyhow that can be a sign of an animal that fought it off and again um hooves that are peeled um you'll see it in them 
Um, you can see something with their antlers. In Montana, the year that the, the EHD breakout was so bad, the mule deer, um, I know outfitters that like 30 or 40% of their bucks still had, um, still had velvet when they killed them in November. Just partials, not like a complete velvet. And they believed that those mule deer fought off EHD, even though they say that EHD has not been super prevalent there. All right, here's another one. This is the one the gentleman sent in and said, when this deer shed, that all of it came off. So as you can see, this deer had, a, I, mean, I mean, when I saw this picture, I was like, wow, what a base measurement that's gonna be. But he said, when the deer came out of um, velvet, all that, it's all the way down by his eye, that that actually fell off. So I don't know if that's a, um, if that is a sign of that, that deer fought off EHD or if he just got some kind of infection or whatever, but he said the deer was completely healthy. He didn't see anything um, abnormal from the deer at that point and things like that. So those are some things that um, you guys can look for. The biggest thing right now, what you guys would want to do if you want to know if you got EHD in your area, one, you can call the DNR and see. Number two is get out there and start looking and walk your creeks, um, check your ponds, uh, I, checking water sources is going to be a pretty telltale sign. Not that you'll find them all there, but um, when you have a farm that, that has them, whether it's four acres, 40 acres, or 400 or 4,000, you'll, you'll know it pretty quickly if you've got it around there, if it's, if it's very large. Uh, Mark says, do the midges have a natural predator like barn swallows, other birds, or bats? If so, let's build birds, bird houses. I hear Lots you. of them. I like the idea. I'm a, uh, I'm a big bat fan because I don't like mosquitoes. Matthew says Wisconsin EHD in 2012, late summer and early summer, they had 427. Early fall of 2015, they had 80 cases. So they, they also had, 2012 must have just been a uh, banner year for EHD. EHD. Yep. Tom says he's going to set up some new stands on Saturday. Good luck, buddy. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't go to Warren County if I was you. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, right now, all the guys out there that have got their food plots in and, and our TBI food plots are going crazy, um, and that's awesome. However, I hope that we're not the ones eating the turnips come January, you know. I mean, it's just one of those deals that you just got to watch them run their course. Um, now, again, this deer's in the wide open. You don't find them all in the wide open. Warren and I did spot one off the road the other day that turned out it was definitely HD. We've had some other people we've talked to, they've spotted them off the road. Um, but if you see a deer standing around in water, acting like it would let you walk up to it, it's probably an EHD. Um, huh? Yeah, so anyhow. All right, well, we just wanted to kind of fill everyone in because it seems like this has been a hot topic right now for sure. And all of you guys, um, but I mean, I, I think the other part that maybe we can do is maybe staying in touch with our DNR because we might be able to um, leverage something in the near future that they, we, they do some research on it and find out if there's some way we can help. But I can tell you this, if they found a way to fight off EHD, then what Warren's been telling you, man, guys, we're going to have to shoot a lot more deer because EHD takes out a lot of them. And that means a lot of guys are going to need to start shooting does. Um, and I know sometimes guys don't want to do that because they, they only have a certain amount of days to hunt and they want to kill a buck. But man, it, I can tell you, it, it has helped us. We, we kill a number of does on our place that right by our house and other places we hunt. And maybe that's one reason why we haven't seen such an outbreak because we don't have the numbers. We try to keep the numbers down. And I can tell you right now, we still haven't caught them. We're not killing 40%. You know oh, that? Yeah, no way. No way are we killing 40. I would, that would be tough to do. Yeah, it would be know? a lot of work. Uh, Brian Paul said, he had both his deer tested last year at Iowa State, and the folks that he talked to said you should not eat venison with EHD. So if you believe that your deer has EHD, there you go. Don't don't eat it. Yeah. So like I said, if you see those hooves, you see something that's odd, antlered, don't look right. Uh, meaning, uh, I don't mean that it's just like a non-typical buck. You know that something looks wrong. Velvet still hanging on. That kind of thing. 
um, testicles that are not dropped or one of them is there. That was what they seemed to find the, in, in the mule deer in Montana that year was, and the telltale was the deer were still partially in velvet and then they roll them over and one testicle on almost every one of those bucks was gone. And I don't think, it, I'm, I can tell you this, they all weren't born that way and they all happened that year. I, they are saying that they fought them. It does, they sound, according to a couple people though, mule deer seem to be more resilient to it. Way more. It doesn't seem like yep. they die from it near as easily as whitetails do. Yep. So. All right, but that also could be just the fact that they live in an altitude where typically the, it's cooler, quicker. Yep. So they don't get it. But for whatever reason, well, anyhow, Hey guys, we sure appreciate you, man. And, and if you guys are just tuning in or, or whatever, and you have not joined the app, you guys need to be getting on there. We've got tons of new stuff. We just came back from our first hunt um, of the year, first first fall hunt of the year. And so we got some more antelope stuff. So those of you guys out there that, uh, like the gentleman that went with us, Craig, who had uh, antelope was on his bucket list. Um, he got to fill his bucket and man, did he fill it with a uh, dandy. So. Um, my point is, is that we got lots of new tips coming on there. We have new uh, manufacturers that have joined for more discounts, all kinds of new stuff. Um, and there's more to come. And those of you that are looking for raised hunting shows, you can go on there at any time and watch them. They're all yep. on there, and including the season six, the season that's airing on Discovery this year. We load those that week as soon as we get, as soon as that show airs. We yep. can't. And that would answer the gentleman that asked earlier too, why are we on, why are we not on outdoor? channel because that way we can give you guys the episodes where um, Outdoor Channel owned our shows for a year. So the Discovery doesn't do that. So all right guys, well enjoy the cooler weather. I hope you don't find any dead deer yet and I hope you guys are having a good summer and it's about time to... We're gone. You killed us. No, no more podcasts coming up. Oh, Dakin is bringing up a good... I thought he was doing like this telling me to stop. Um, what I need to mention to you guys is we won't be podcasting next Tuesday and probably not for the next several weeks. We'll do some live um, videos for you guys and things like that, but actually we've got to go out and do our job and that is we got some hunts we got to be on. So we're not going to be able to be here in the office. So we'll be still doing some live stuff and we'll try our best to catch up with you guys at 6.30 in the evenings, but I can tell you 6.30 in the evening in Montana, I'm pretty sure if he's got a tag in his pocket for an elk, He's not going to be wanting to talk to you guys, even if I, maybe I'll turn the phone on him and say, Warren, we've got to go live. And then you guys could watch him hunting his up. We'll, we'll keep it as updated as we can, but we yeah. just won't be able to be as consistent. So, But then yep. we should have tons of new material after this year. So appreciate you guys with everything you've done. This has been a huge support for the podcast deal and a huge support for the app. And we appreciate that. So keep letting all your friends know, join the app. And who knows, we might see you guys um, Golf tournament. Raise the full draw is having a golf tournament slash archery tournament. What are the dates? Does someone have the date for that? September 28th, September 28th right outside of Des Moines. Um, go to Raised Hunting or to Raise the Full Draw's Facebook page and you'll see it on there. But this is going to be a cool deal. Um, not many golf courses let you shoot bows on them and you're going to get to do both. And we just got word that Van Wall Power Equipment is going to have a hole in one. If you hit a hole in one on that, you're going to win uh, a gator. So, and I don't mean the kind with teeth. I mean the kind that you drive. And I have one, and I love it. What? Well, and the book. Gosh, dang, Deacon is wearing me out here because Karen is telling him. So, and then if you haven't bought a copy of the Raised Hunting book, make sure that you do so. All right. And then new hats. Okay, you guys, this is a sales, like, no, I'm, I'm done. This is, this is the outdoor home, what is it called, uh, home shopping network? No, we're done. We're all out of here. But anyhow, all that stuff's available. Get ready for Christmas early. Get, you know, go to our website and find what you need. Um, mainly, guys, do something that supports hunting and get someone else involved. That's the way we're going to keep this thing alive. Send us all your pictures. So good luck, everybody, this fall. Make sure you send us your pictures, and we will talk to you soon.